Collecting ancient coins obviously is a hobby that connects us to the past. And one of the clearest messages it passes is that the ancient world was an excessively violent, militarized, belligerent place. But most, if not all of you watching this video live and enjoy the peace and relative prosperity of the modern world, and the brutality depicted on our little pieces of history remain at just that. Nice little trinkets that reminds us of the barbarism of the past. But there is another thing that history teaches us, and that is that humans from a couple of millennia ago are very similar to humans of today. We aspire for reasonably similar things, we fear the same things, and unfortunately with the recent events happening on the world geopolitical stage, we see that, sadly, falling back down to the horrors of war is just a couple of political miscalculations away. So today let's be a little bit more philosophical. We're going to explore war and peace on coinage. How did powerful men of different civilizations show their military power on coinage? How they used them as tools of war propaganda? How the pursuit for war and peace affected coin design? And even how war directly affected the quality of coinage? Let's go! Nowadays we live in a political world that is actually highly unusual if we consider the history of civilization. This is a world of very stiff and, at least until a couple of weeks ago, sacrosanct borders where the idea of wars of expansion or pillage are considered acts of total barbarism. But back in the quote-unquote old days, wars were nothing more than another tool for enriching the state, with disputes between nations most often being solved by the sword rather than with diplomats. This resulted in highly militarized societies and the normalization of physicality that would sound absurd to anyone today, but it was considered normal back then. Pretty much every culture had a major god or deity dedicated to war. Think about the Greek or Roman Ares, the Germano-Nordic Tyr, the Egyptian Montu, even monotheistic religions, such as Christianity, found a way to bend their one-god rule with the addition of inferior deities to represent warriors, such as, for example, the Archangel Michael, which some might argue is not a war entity, but clearly brings up the virtues of virility and physicality with it. But if there is one symbol that illustrates this inherent human aggressive energy, I would say my favorite is that of the lion attacking the bull. If you collect coins, this is not an, old, an unusual symbol for you. It is one of the oldest artistic depictions we have records of, with some claiming it was Iranian in origins, but it, had, it quickly spread to other areas, including the Greek world, and then to the European continent at large. Although at first glance this might just look like a violent scene of a lion attacking the bull, this is not a positive nor a negative image. It is a metaphor to the power of men to do great things, to aspire, to spend energy. A lion extracts its sustenance from its prey, just like men going to battle for fame and riches. But it can have positive interpretations as well, like a farmer extracting sustenance from the soil, a city raising a temple in efforts of appeasing their god, it shows that deep inside, men are insatiable creatures, designed by god or whatever, to try to do great things. And this brings us to our first coin. This motif of the lion and the bull can be commonly found on Greek coins as well, such as the Steta Drachma from the city of Akantos, dated between 470 and 430 BC. The city was an important local com commercial port, and these imposing coins show that they had enough silver circulating around to justify making a mint cap capable of striking these very impressive coins. On the obverse, we can see the lion bouncing over the bull and biting its rear end. The poor bull is <laughs> trying to hit the lion with its horns and has its mouth open, probably in pain. A very brutal scene, but as I just explained, it does not have neither a good nor a bad message 
it is the expenditure of energy it is the almost like a yin yang thing the flow of energy through life through the planet it just shows the insatiable human spirit for more the reverse is much simpler we just have an incused punch made out of four squares And since we're talking about war, I could not leave Alexander the Great, one of the most successful conquerors of history, behind us. The coinage of Alexander has been very well explored on, on this channel, particularly the silver coins. But for the purpose of this video, I had to talk about his staple gold coin, the Stator. It's the most important of his coins because it is a major statement of power to not only the Greek populations under his rule, but to the geopolitical stage at the time at large. This example, a posthumous coin struck between 311 and 300 BC under Seleucus, one of his successors, is attributed to a very interesting mint, the mint of Babylon, right at the heart of the once great Persian Empire brought down by Alexander. The very same gold this coin was made out of is already a statement of power. War was fought on a, on a numismatic battlefield, to a sense, as precious metals exchanged hands during times of war, and it was on the conqueror's best interest to re-strike old coins from the conquered people into new coins with your own design and your own message. The Achaemenids had massive reserves of gold and silver on their treasuries, and their own staple gold coin, the Darik, was one of the first internationally recognizable and accepted coins. Certainly, many made their way throughout the years to the Greek mainland, the same Greek mainland, mind you, that was invaded by the Persians centuries prior, and the same Greece was now on the offensive. When we look at the obverse of this coin, the proud Achaemenid king from the Dadic gave way to the smiling bust of Athena, one of the most recognizable Greek symbols ever. We can't understate the effect this must have had on the people back then. To see the sole common Dadics be replaced for thousands and thousands of Athenas would have been just as impactful as if nowadays you saw a newspaper and television claiming a new world order of Greek hegemony had begun. When we head to the reverse, we have another feminine fig figure, Nike, the incarnation of victory, the messenger of Zeus, entrusted by him to bless the generals chosen by the king of the gods to be victorious, which we can see by the laurel, laurel crown she is carrying. And who was supposed to be handed this crown? Well, the legends give us the answer. Basileus Alexandro of King Alexander. This is for me one of the most historically impactful coins ever. It is not a rare coin, although gold is always desirable, but it is not a rare coin, still it is such an important piece. The Greek supremacy ushered by Alexander will reverberate throughout time, throughout the civilizations it influenced, and I would argue that the geopolitical and cultural order we have today has some of its roots linked to this conquest. So successful and so impactful was Alexander's wars that he managed to transform Greek society. The classical period of the city-states gave way to the great unified kingdoms of the later Hellenistic period. This is another very famous coin of the period, a tetadrachma struck under one of Alexander's successors, Lysimachus. Such a lovely piece, it's such a beautiful design. This piece was struck between 305 and 281 BC at the city of Lampsakos, one of Alexander's main bases of operations, and a place that was certainly very enriched and very transformed by his conquests. One of the ways kings and emperors tried to enhance their legitimacy was through the cult of personalities, not only of yourself, but connecting your image to that of great men of the past. So this is what we have on the obverse. We don't have the bust of Lysimachus, but the one from Alexander, wearing the royal diadem of kings and the horns of Amon Zeus, giving him a deified status after his death. Coins bearing Alexander's face will be struck for centuries. But it is the reverse that fascinates me the most about this coin. Athena is probably the most common deity to feature on Greek coins, after Zeus, her father. This should be counterintuitive, 
considering Zeus was the maximum Greek, Greek deity. But Athena, being the daughter of Zeus, was also the goddess that compensated for her father's flaws. She was wise and thoughtful, while Zeus was often very impulsive and tyrannical. After all, he had the maximum power, and he abused it. She blessed those in defensive wars, while Zeus was pure and raw authority and power. Athena represented civilization, the urbanized Greek way of life, the willingness to trade and talk rather than purely conquer. She was seen as an incarnation of the state, as a protective and nurturing entity in a very violent and wild world. And this benign imagery appealed to the masses greatly. History is obviously written by the major kings and generals, especially the victorious ones, but the burden of human civilization was carried by the small guy, the trader, the farmer, the craftsman, the builder. And for those, Athena was the preferred goddess, of course. We nowadays are surrounded by modernized depictions of Athena. Lady Liberty for Americans, Helvetia for the Swiss, Britannia for the British, all of them show this idea of the good side of the state as a preserver of peace, as a protector against foreign aggression. But unfortunately, the Greeks did not hear the advices of Athena enough. The Hellenistic period and its massive empires was marked by endless wars between these states, and this just weakened the overall Greek world. The result is that it fell under influence of a much more unified influence from the West, the Roman Republic. For our next coin, we stay in Macedon. In fact, we stay in the very same city of the previous coin, Amphipolis. Now we go to the year 167 BC. Rome has taken over Macedon, but as with many s smart leaders, they did not claim to be invaders. They claimed to be liberators, protectors, benefactors. And this cooperating message is absolutely what we see when we, obver when we look at the lovely obverse of this tetadrachma. Remember I said previously that one of the first things a conquering people did was to impose their imagery upon the conquered one? Well, we don't see this here. The coin, the design of the coin is unequivocally Greek. We see at the center a bust of Artemis, the Greek goddess protector of woodlands and nature, and behind her a massive Macedonian shield. Romans were masters of political propaganda, and this coin clearly does not show itself to be struck under Roman authority. When we head to the reverse, however, things change in subtle ways. We have around the design this nice oak leaf wreath, once again a very Greek design. At the translated legends, we read something like the first Marys or administrative district of Macedonia. And at the center, the Club of Hercules. The Argad dynasty, Alexander's family, was said to, ha to be descendants, like direct descendants from Hercules himself. So, well, once again, nothing wrong with showing the Hercules club in Alexander's native region, Macedon. But, I mean, they could have picked many other benign designs. The seated Athena from the previous coin, Nike whatever, but they picked Hercules' club, the brutish, violent, warlike Hercules. This coin has a very subtle, well, well, not that subtle, actually, warning. The club doesn't belong, belong to Greece anymore, it belongs to Rome now, and it will be used upon any people who have any funny ideas. We will let you have your way of life, your Greek culture, but this is Roman territory now. Such a beautiful coin with such a strong message. This is also not a very rare coin, but it is so desirable because it is just so full of historical content and propaganda. It's a great piece. The Roman Republic gave way to the Roman Empire, and with it, one of the most lethal war machines the ancient world had seen up to this point. Flexible, fast, and nearly unstoppable, the Romans carved a massive empire that spawned three continents all under the boots of its legionaries. And among the best of Roman generals was the general emperor Trajan, the optimal pickups or the best emperor. Trajan is one of these cases where we get blinded by his accomplishments and forget that these came with a heavy cost in blood. 
Think about this for a second. Imagine yourself as a judge. How would you judge Trajan? During his 19 years he reigned, he was pretty much incredible. It was a glorious time for the millions of citizens of the empire. He stabilized politics, put competent people in positions of power, guaranteed safe borders and trade routes which allowed the everyday person to develop their economic activities, but especially he ushered an economic boom to the empire by bringing tons of precious metals from plundered enemies and thousands of captured slaves. For some, he was a protector and a great man. For others, a savage who ruined the world. How could you judge this man? But how could you judge this man using the metrics of the time instead of our modern metrics? On the obverse of this coin, we see the very typical portrait of Trajan wearing the laurel wreath. The legends read Imperator Nerva Caesar Traiano Augustus Germanicus. Notice the Germanicus, which means conqueror of the Germans. On a move to validate his reign, he even added to his own imperial name that he vanquished an entire people. Once again, we can't judge Trajan with modern morality, but it is mind-boggling to think that such a thing was just normal and in fact commendable. Heading to the rivers, we have once again Hercules, but this time we don't have just the club. We have the hero himself, stepping open an altar, holding the club and the skin of the Nemean lion. On the legends, we can read more of Trajan's titles. Pontifex Maximus, Tribunicia Potestas, Consul for the Fourth Year, Pater Patriae. But obviously it was not all blood and gore for Roman coinage. Some coins had more benign imagery. Here we have the well-known tribute Penny from the story of the Bible, which also portrays the Romans as violent invaders. This coin was struck in Lugdunum, modern-day Lyon in France, during the reign of Tiberius between 14 and 37 AD, so right at the time when Jesus was born. Although a bit too far from where Jesus lived for it to reasonably be the coin of the story. Heading to the obverse, we see the bust of Tiberius, and the legends, in this case, appeal to a more religious right to rule. Tiberius Caesar, Dewi Augustus Filius, or the son of the deified Augustus, Augustus again, this time referring to himself, the current emperor. On the reverse, contrasting to Trajan's military depiction, now we have Pax, the goddess of peace holding an olive branch, which was used during hostilities when one side wanted to surrender or negotiate. The interpretation of Pax for the Romans, however, was different to what we might get at first glance. We might think this coin was just a wish for peace, but in reality, Pax represented the Pax Romana, the stability after Roman conquest, with the quiet subjugation of the captured region, the integration in the Roman fold, and to no revolts, allowing people to resume their lives quickly under new management. This kind of quote-unquote hypocrisy by the Romans is best summarized by Calgatus, a tribal leader from Britain, who said in a speech that the Romans turn robbery, slaughter, plunder, and name it empire. They make it a desert and call it peace. And finally, for the last coin of the day, I have brought an example of how you can, in many cases, see how a nation is going. For example, going in war, almost like feeling the pulse of a state by the quality, quality and state of its coinage. The, descend, the descendants of the Romans, the Byzantine Empire, have some of the most spectacular examples of numismatic art from the Middle Ages. Beautiful depictions of the emperor and the saints, particularly on its gold and silver coinage. Yet, for this coin, we're going to the very end of the empire, in the year 1425. The Romans are desperate. The Ottoman Turks are on the offensive, with the empire reduced to Constantinople and its outskirts. Emperor John VIII rules over a depopulated Constantinople. He has to confiscate silver from the local churches and relies in his cannon maker to engrave the dice for his crude coins, a far cry from the glorious coinage of the Byzantine past. On the obverse, we see, barely discernible, the Nimbate bust of Christ with pellets around the border. 
These coins, called Stavratons, were used to pay you to the, to the very last defenders of the city. Heading to the rivers, also barely recognizable, we have the bust of the Emperor, with poorly written legends in two circular lines, which read Despot John the Paleologan, Emperor of the Romans by the grace of God. Fortunately for John, he would not see the final fall of Constantinople, dying before the final siege. It was left to his brother, Constantine XI, the last Roman Emperor, the duty to command the final troops of Byzantium against the final push of the Turks, a sad end for the great Romans. I hope these coins shown today give you a small glimpse of a somewhat ugly sign of human nature, a side where war, aggression, excessive action are just part of the human condition, sadly. History teaches us how easily we can succumb to the wars of our human condition and once again bring forward the barbarisms of war. Fortunately for us numismatists, we have these beautiful coins that show us and remind us of our violent and ruthless past, a stark reminder for us not to repeat the warlike ways of our forefathers. This brings me to the lovely sponsors of this video and the people who film me these great coins today. If you particularly like any of these coins shown and would like to get one of them for your own collection, I have some good news for you. Our friends at Savoca Coins will be organizing their 128th silver auction next March 20, 2022, where these and other great coins will be up for auction. Their silver auctions focus on higher quality pieces, so if you're looking for quality, for good condition and for rarities, definitely check them out. There's something for everyone there. Greek, Roman, medieval, Byzantine, even modern pieces. And if you are watching this video after the auction date, don't worry. Just head over to savaka-coins.com and take a look, as other auctions should definitely be happening soon. So now I want to hear from you collectors. Have you got a coin depicting war or peace? Do you have any particular coins of the theme you would like to share? Let us know in the comment section down below. I hope you all enjoyed this video, say no to war, happy collecting, and I'll see you soon.